Good morning and welcome to another episode of This Week in Digital Parenting with me, Josh Ramsey. Uh, another week has passed and here we are again. I hope you have been enjoying these episodes and please remember that all of the episodes are recorded and are on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and check over some of the things we've already spoken about. I am ready to jump in to this week's uh, episode and just making sure that everything is on board. So, and there we go, the first uh, little hiccup of the morning. I realize I didn't take my uh, landing screen off. So welcome everyone to this week in digital parenting with me, Josh Ramsey. Uh, today is a follow-on from last week. Um, I was really struck by one of the questions that we dealt with last week, which was from a mom talking about her 10-year-old child who is permanently attached to their screen or their, their cell phone. And the parent was asking the question, should I do something about it or should I not? And that really got me thinking about where moms and dads might be in their awareness of the access that their children have to information through their devices. So I wanted to focus today on content control, on age restrictions, and explore some of the speaking points around that space, and then leave you guys with a very practical solution that I have found really, really valuable as I help parents get fe give parents feedback on what apps are okay, what um, what games they should be aware of, and the content within all of these games, movies, apps that we are seeing. So I'd like to start off by talking to you a little bit about content control. And I think what's important about it is that when I think about parents setting restrictions for what their children are allowed to interact with, really, for me, those restrictions are a bit further down the track than I think this conversation starts. And where I think this conversation starts is really with you and your partner, or you if you're a single parent, really reflecting on your family values. And I attended a webinar last week by Nikki Bush, who was very, very uh, clear in her description of how family brands need to be established. You know, if you think about any brands out there, uh, you think of Nike, you think of immediately just do it, or you you think of um, maybe a brand like uh, Subaru, which is a, a, a car brand, but it's, it's very much to do with being in the outdoors and having a very robust system that you can trust. So when you think about your family, and you're thinking about restrictions and content restrictions, you're really wanting to base those on your values. What are the values that you hold dear in your family? Maybe those are to do with your religion. Maybe those are to do with the way that you're brought up. Um, and it's from those values that you then extrapolate these limitations to, to what your children can and do uh, online. So that's the first point, is that really... I think that parents need to be thinking about what are the values in my family that I think are important? Do I think that uh, manners are very, uh, very valuable? And if that's the case, then, you know, uh, a cartoon where you've got really rebellious children that are always speaking against their parents and doing whatever they want, that's obviously not going to fall inside your, your value structure for your family. And so that's going to be the reason why you don't want your children uh, engaging with that media. What I think is also important is understanding that different children at different ages can have different limitations and they need to be presented these limits in a way in which they can engage with. So, you may need to really grapple back and forth with your 10-year-old or your 12-year-old, 13-year-old for them to understand why certain apps are not good or you don't approve of them spending time doing certain things with their devices. And I would really 
use it as an opportunity, especially with those older children, so 10 and above that, to really put the ball in their court to say, so you really want this device or you really want to play this game that your parent, that your friends are playing? Can you explain to me why? Can you explain to me what you're going to get out of it, where the game is set, uh, what you're going to be doing in the game? And you can really put the ball in their court to 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 bring you the answers that you need so that you can make a decision. I think we need to as much as possible be empowering our children to make choices that that mean that they're accountable to the the consequences of those choices. And as a parent, that means that really put the ball in their courts. If they want to play a game, you know, get them to do research on it, bring them, ask them to go find an article online that, that talks about the value of it. Um, maybe you can even set them challenges to, to research uh, the, the history and the context of where that game is coming from. Um, but I think as parents, we need to understand that it's really because the way in which games are now distrib distributed, movies, games, and the access that our children have directly to the creators of content, we have to understand that as parents, it's your job to stand in between your child and that content. And let me explain this a little bit further. So, if you think about in the South African context, we've got two major bodies that are regulating uh, the the kind of, of content that is available to our children. And that's really the, the organizations that put a stamp on the content. Either it's a PG-13 or it's a PG-18 or whatever the case may be. And the two major bodies are the Electronic Software Ratings Bureau and then the Film and Publications Board. And what we need to know is that content creation is always further ahead than regulation and content moderation. And generally, content creators rely on distribution channels. So if I'm a movie maker, I make a movie, I want to take that out into the market, I want it to be all over Sturkenico, then I need to go via the film and publication board to get a stamp on it so that it can be put in the correct category and sold to the right market. Uh, similarly, if I'm a a game developer and I want to distribute my game in all of, you know, through Take A Lot and Incredible Connection and uh, all these uh, distribution networks that are available to me, I have to go via the Electronic Software Ratings Bureau. Now, what is important is that because consumers, uh, that's us and even your children are consumers, are now going direct to content creators for content, the ability to moderate that content is really, really reduced. So in the example of apps, for example, very often it's the app developers themselves that are placing the age uh, gate onto their product. And what that means, obviously, is that the lower the age limit they can put on it, the more users that is open to, and then the more engagement they'll have with that app, which turns into money for them. So... I think the time of really relying on third-party uh, organizations to be our eyes and ears on what is okay and not okay is, is, is gone. And I think another layer of complexity to this is the fact that games nowadays are not like the games that we might have grown up with when we were children. And let me give you some insight. So if you take a game like Fortnite, Fortnite is a fast-paced first-person shooter. It's not very graphically violent, but it is very much, you know, tapping into our children's desire to survive and compete and master a skill. But more than that, it also brings in social networking. So it is leveraging our children's natural desire to want connection. And now more than ever, you know, our children are desperate for interactions, conversations. And so if they go into the world of Fortnite, not only do they get that engaging felt experience of fun, they also get the opportunity to talk to people. 
And one to really watch is they also get the opportunity to be in a marketplace. And what we're seeing in games these days is that they are combining all of these aspects to make sure that our ch children are completely engrossed with uh, their offering. So there's a game that they're playing, there's a community that they're building, and there is status within the community due to items that they may have or skins. They call them skins. That's basically the clothing your character will wear or the way that the weapons look. And that one really relates to money. And so we have this environment in which your children are interacting with a game and having fun, but they've also got this component of money, which is a very real thing. And, you know, you only need to Google a, a little bit to find a horror story of some parent whose credit card has been charged with hundreds of dollars because their child was buying items in an online game. And very often, just like the question that stuck with me from last week, uh, where this parent was asking about is it okay for my child to be lost in their phone for ages? Is that parents really have no clue about what is going on inside these games. They might just see, uh, you know, the cover screen where your child brings you the phone and says, can I have your fingerprint? And it's in that moment where you're thinking about the bills, you're thinking about COVID, and you put your finger down on the phone and your child is gone and you're happy that they're gone. You can focus on what you're doing. And you have no idea that you've just, you know, maybe opened a doorway for them to go and explore with adults that you may not know, or you've opened a door for them to go and buy things in an online shop. So, again, this really, for me, comes back to the fact that we can no longer rely on third-party organizations to tell us what is okay and not okay. And it really is important that as parents and as heads of the family, we are thinking about the values that we want our family to be known for. Um, uh, again, you know, it comes to mind when I was in Nikki Bush's webinar and she was talking about the fact that, you know, when, when if you go around to play a play date uh, at another family's house, not great example now, but the point being is that when you leave, those, the family that you visited will, will think of your family and think of certain words. You know, that family are so adventurous, that family is so disconnected, or that family is so curious, or those, that family is so communicative. And really, as parents, for you to think about how do you want to be known um, by your peers or by your community? What are the values that you want to be important? And as your children get older, you can communicate these values to them. You know, uh, my surname is Ramsey, so the Ramsey family is um, honorable or honest or, you know, and speaking to your kids about what they think uh, they would like to be known for uh, by their friends or by their teachers and, and, and looking for ways to bring those values into conversations with your kids so that they can make these kind of decisions on what is appropriate and not appropriate. Um, there are three aspects that we should think about when we, when we think about how your children build their kind of online habits and, and define themselves by the apps and platforms that they use online. So the first one being really, you have to know that the values of your child are constantly being influenced by their community. That's why you are willing to sacrifice so much to put them in a certain school that is, you know, promising you that they have certain values. And because you're aligned with those values, you're willing to invest in the school and the teachers and trust them that those values will be transferred to your child. So when you're assessing the kind of digital environment that your child is in, try and, and figure out what are the three values that this, that this platform, what are the three values that they're offering my child? You know, I think the second one is really 
the nature of the, the platform itself. So for a good example, if we contrast two very different games, both of them are first person. Uh, that means that they're 3D environments where your, your child takes control of a character and moves around a 3D environment. So if we take on the one hand Fortnite, which is this fast paced, survival based, um, adrenaline, endorphin rich, uh, very much trendy offering and another game like Minecraft, which is a lot less graphically engaging, but a lot more open and a lot more conducive to, to creative play. Now, if you take the two of those, depending on, on where your child spends their time, they'll be learning different things. And because of the, the, the motivation behind the development of that platform, your child will have a different experience. So, you know, Fortnite is made to engage children, to keep them playing, to keep them into the next season. So they release seasons in the game. Um, and children obviously want to have things that are trendy while they're playing. So that's fashion, that's buying things versus Minecraft, which is more an open world environment where your child gets to create and really has to figure things out in terms of how to put certain items together to build things. So they really are doing a lot more creative thinking than more survival based responding or reacting. Um, I described in an earlier video that different games and different uh, apps will engage either the thinking or the feeling brain. And we're really wanting our children to grow those two brains together so that your thinking brain and your feeling brain are growing at the same rate. And that's really the crux of emotional intelligence. And in a moment, I'm going to take you to a tool that we have that can help to build your child's emotional intelligence as they play games and as they use screens. And then the final one, of course, being your child's ability to stop. And this might be the most telling. Now, games that are designed to keep your child on the platform will, just like Netflix, as soon as you finish an episode, it counts down to the next episode. And invariably, we get stuck into this binge of watching episode after episode. And Within the actual game design, you'll, you'll very clearly see that there are ways that these designers are trying to make your child stay in the platform. And so that's another way for you to assess the game that they're playing. How easy is it to stop? And that might simply be, you know, when you ask your child to stop, do they? Are they able to turn off? Um, do they consistently talk about it? Do they... Are they kind of obsessive around it? And all of those would be signals that they are getting overstimulated in their feeling brain and, and, and not stimulated enough in their thinking brain. So that's a bit of a top level kind of discussion around what we can start to think about when we think about placing restrictions in our home and on our children. What I'd like to do now is actually take you to some of the resources that are out there so that you can really see uh, what I'm talking about in terms of the need to, to, to use tools that are actually quite useful. So over here, you can see the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. And what I think is so interesting is that the first the first line or the first block of information here is how you buy the game, which is interesting. So you've got GameStop, Amazon, Walmart. This is an American um, ratings uh, website, but immediately they're showing you how to get the game as opposed to giving you useful information about the game. And this can be a, a great telltale sign for you as a critically thinking parent to assess the game. When you research it, what kind of information are you getting back? Are you getting back practical advice on, on how to make your decision? Or are you getting pushed towards buying the game? And if you're getting pushed towards buying the game, 
it's probably because that game has a strong commercial component or a strong kind of obsessive component where they're wanting your child to not stop using it. This Close at a Home is the website for our film and publication board. And for me, this website is a, is a great example of um, how hard it is to stay current on content that's out there. So there's a lot of information here about coronavirus, um, which is obviously very relevant. But I found the website quite quite hard to, to, to dig into to find the information that I need as a parent to make a choice about what my children are doing uh, on, their, on, on their devices and what apps that I should be letting them use. So if we have a look here, and this is really the resource that I would like you as a parent to use, along with our website where we try and update you on, on the latest developments in terms of apps that are out there. But the, the website that, um, that you can see right here, I've put the URL uh, just over there. It's commonsensemedia.org. And this is a fantastic organization that we have been in direct contact with and is one of our alliance partners. And they do something very interesting and quite unique. They, um, and if you have a look, oh, sorry, over there, you can see two blocks. The one block says parents say, and the other block says kids say. And what they do is that not only do they review the, the platforms themselves or the games or the movies themselves, but they also get kids to do the same thing so that you can start to see what kids think and what parents think. So, for example, here I've got TikTok up there. And not only will it give you a ratings kind of in an age grouping. So here it's saying 15 plus. Um, but it, it's also going to give you more information about the themes that exist within that platform. Um, you know, there was a question last week about uh, a parent wanting to know if, TikTok was okay for a 10 year old and all you need to do as a parent is spend five minutes on the platform that your child is asking you about and really that's along with going to websites like our uh, beintouch.org uh, za or commonsensemedia.org to learn about the platform that your child is asking you about but just to actually go into it yourself and spend five minutes on that platform. I guarantee you, if you go to TikTok, within the first 10 videos, you will see a woman in her bikini doing something that's, you know, that's quite uh, provocative. So you can then, as a parent, revert back to your values in terms of what you want to be important to your kids in your home and very quickly make a decision on whether or not that app is appropriate. Of course, if your child is quite young, um, the more you can limit their exposure to even asking for the platforms, the better. And, and I think as a part of that, it's important for parents to talk to other parents. So in your school body or you know, in, the, in the days of old when sleepovers were happen happening, making sure that when you drop your child, you take a moment to ask the parent, you know, are you showing any videos tonight? Is there a movie night? Um, what movies are you going to be showing? These are the values that I think are important for my child. And though it might seem a bit uh, cumbersome to do that, but really taking the time to to have those conversations, to to talk to other parents about what you want for your child. I'm going to take us through uh, a few ideas that we have at Common Sense Media. Um, Kate Farina put together a wonderful blog that is uh, on our homepage. And if you just scroll to the bottom of our homepage, you'll see a, a blog there about uh, screen use in the current context. And she had some great ideas for ways in which you can engage your kids on um, the the, the screens that they're using. I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller here so I can get out of the way and so that we can take ourselves through this, um, this list that we've got. So Kate had a great idea around using, um, using your, your car at home as a form of uh, drive-in where you can, you know, put the kids in the car, give them a screen or set up a screen and, and they can spend that time 
you know, watching something engaging and you know that they're safe and you can get going with maybe a meeting that you have or a webinar or a piece of work that you have to have uninterrupted, you know, deep diving time for. Uh, listening to podcasts and books, I think this is a great way to help children engage their in imagination. And that's one of the ways in which uh, I think time is really lost uh, in terms of our children's development time uh, by using screens, is that so much of the work of entertaining themselves is done by the screen itself. So putting on a podcast or a book and, and you know, inviting your child to think through um, how they are experiencing that podcast. Maybe it's helping them imagine the fantasy world in which the story exists. And, you know, the next few, the next three ideas really talk to the fact that there is so much um, opportunity for learning online, uh, as opposed to being very passive consumers of information. And so, setting your child a challenge of learning to do something. Maybe it's art, maybe it's learning a new skill, maybe it's coding, maybe it's learning how to do some physical exercise or um, writing where they can take the initiative to go and watch a YouTube clip and you can help them find it. You know, um, so often with, with parents, uh, they ask me a question and sometimes I'll literally Google the question they ask and there's a really practical solution there. And helping your children use the internet in a way that empowers them, that they can ask questions and find solutions themselves. So interacting games like Scrabble or Monopoly or even Sudoku where where the children actually have to work a little bit for that feeling of satisfaction, of completion, um, where it's not just handed over to them. And really, that's another way that you as a parent can, can assess the games or, or the platforms that your children are using. You know, how much work do they have to do to feel content with how they are doing in that game or on that platform? Um, and very often, the platforms that are that are tying our children in are really doing all the work for them, and and that results in our children not having the grit to to push through things and to you know develop the determination they need to get the outcome that they want. You know, digital editing and using phones or using even if they've got an old camera and starting to play around with how they can create graphics or manipulate images can be a very engaging way for them to interact with their devices. And this really leads us to, you know, this conversation of is your child's screen time, is it fun or is it functional? And and not to say there's anything wrong with fun screen time if it's in line with your family values, but how can we push our children towards being functional in the way that they use their screens? I want to spend a little bit of a moment on, on this, uh, uh, this image right here. And this is a resource that we have available on our website. It's called the Screen Time Mood Measure. And what you're wanting to do here is help your child to learn more about how they feel after their time spent on a screen. And this is really the essence of emotional intelligence, right? It's our ability to name how we feel, to, to control how we, well, not control, but to be aware of how our actions are making us feel. So this uh, download is available on our beintouch.org.za slash live page, if that's where you're watching. And it's just on the left of the screen there. Uh, you can just click on it and download. And basically what you can do is ask your child to fill this in for the next five days. So how they feel before using their screen and then how they feel after. And if you can also get them to identify what they were doing on their screens, you can help them to understand how their screens are making them feel. And and that's really the crux of what I wanted to leave you with today. So, number one, 
are the the values that your child op is picking up from this platform are they in line with your family values and how does your child feel after they've been using the screen that they have i want to do one question quickly because i see that we are running out of a little bit of time here okay um has anyone actually asked children how they feel about the school closures my child is stressing about the fact that she won't be able to see her friends and doesn't know what to do about this okay so yeah i think it's important that we understand that our children are taking their cues from us in terms of how serious this environment that we're currently in is and um in terms of creating a safe place for your children to interact online uh, we will be launching out a, a new safer social media service called go bubble which is uh, basically built to be a much more um safe environment for our children to interact with one another online so please keep posted as we will putting be putting up some blogs about it this week and talking more about it uh, in the weeks to come so i think a quick answer to that um, parents question is just simply that know that your child is going to be taking their cue from you in terms of what is how they should be responding to the current climate and if you can convey that sense of stability and anchor at least when you're in front of them it's going to help them feel more okay with how things are going okay so i hope that was useful and i hope that as you think about what content you want your children to be engaging with you are thinking about your family values have a great week ahead and Thank you for joining us on this stream.